Hi there. I was happy to uh, accept this invitation by Kevin Liebe to provide a course about computational audiology, past, present and future applications. And it will be a trip around the world of AI and audiology within 80 slides, um, where I hope to share lots of interesting concepts, inspiring people and maybe even some heroes. Um, and well, one of the first heroes I would like to mention is the French writer Jules Verne, who was the writer of Around the World in 80 Days. Um, at the time it was called an adventure novel because the term science fiction was not coined yet. And what I think is important for this uh, journey I would like to take with you is realize that it's always more complex and it's just one journey around the world, if you uh, like to say so. Also in time, we're going from the past to present and future applications. But it's, uh, of course, not a full picture of what's happening around the world. And there's many more interesting projects that are unfortunately not able to discuss in this talk or that I'm maybe not uh, even aware of yet. So let's, um, let's start. And what I forgot to mention is that the quote, uh, it's always more complex, is uh, taken from Dr. Stephen Novella from the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. So for this course, there's uh, three learning outcomes I would like to focus uh, on. I want to provide you examples of computational audiology, provide backgrounds about AI so that you can better understand how it can be used in audiology, and also assess some of the potential risks and opportunities and things we can do as clinicians to um, make these applications more viable and accessible by, uh, by patients. You will not learn uh, yourself how to build a, an AI system, but I will provide some resources and interesting material to study so that you can master AI and hopefully you will become more aware of how to use AI. So um, this talk is aimed at innovative clinicians and let's first dive into my background and then into AI. Um, so I studied physics and worked briefly in aerospace and now I'm working in Nijmegen at the Radboud UMC as audiologist and also doing a part-time PhD. And at this at our campus in Nijmegen, there are really strong research groups in artificial intelligence, biophysics, ENT audiology, so there's the hearing and implant team and the hearing and genes team. Um, and since our organization has the strategy to create strong networks between care providers to have a significant impact on people's health, it was quite natural to develop my own motto, Connecto Ergo Possum. So I network, therefore I can, which probably also determines the strengths of a neural network, since that's based on its connections and relative weight. And when in 2019, um, I discussed some of the plans I had in using artificial intelligence in audiology, uh, the computational pathologist Jeroen van der Laak suggested to me, well, what you're trying to do, that sounds like computational audiology. And well, that was a nice umbrella term to start my personal journal in journey in AI and audiology. So let's first have a look at AI. And there, I think we should start with the definition of an algorithm, which is basically a set of step-by-step -step instructions that describe how to perform a task, but it's a finite a set of instructions so it will end so that you don't get in an infinite loop. You may think of it as a, as a recipe and it can be really complex um, but in the end you will uh, finish your task and those tasks can be performed by humans um, or by computers. And where does the term algorithm come from? Well here then are our journey starts in the Middle East, uh, where Mohammed ibn Musa al Ritzmi, around 1825, uh, wrote books about computations. And that's where the term was derived uh, from. 
Um, let's continue this timeline. Um, but after I've explained more about artificial intelligence. Um, in general, you could say there's two categories. There's weak or narrow AI, which is built for a particular set of tasks like chess playing, self-driving cars, but also image classification, speech recognition, or music recommendation. And this is basically where now all the breakthroughs are. And um, what's impressing us already. Then there is artificial general intelligence, which would be an autonomous system that surpasses human capabilities in the majority of economical, in economically valuable tasks. Or you could also regard it as an artificial conscience. So far, that's only known in science fiction. Um, so you can think of R2-D2 in Star Wars, or um, I think it's the voice of uh, Charlotte uh, jo Scarlett, uh, Johansson uh, in the movie Her. Um, but that's now still science fiction. So let's focus on narrow AI. How does it work? Well, basically, you first define a task. Um, so I have here the example about speech recognition, where a network has to convert spoken language into, into text. And this can, of course, be useful for transcription services or voice assistance. Um, and then you need performance metrics. So an, an example would be the word error rate. And this measures the network's effectiveness. And then we set the objective. So the network's primary goal is to maximize the performance metric by continuously learning and improving its ability to recognize speech. This is done by training the neural network. And by training, and sometimes uh, in its supervised rewarding the, the system, it will become better in extracting text from audio files. It's important to have a really good training set. So it should be a diverse set of audio examples and corresponding transcriptions. The network will maybe extract features like uh, pitch, tone or speaker. But it also depends on the architecture of the system if we are even able to look into this uh, black box. And then if it's trained, you can deploy this uh, system on similar tasks, so similar audio. And a speech recognition network, for instance, would not uh, perform well on image recognition. And here to the right, you see uh, an example of the wave 2 fec uh, 2.0 model architecture, which was uh, originally developed by Facebook. Um, but you can download it on uh, Hugging Face and and, uh, and use it yourself for your own applications. Then um, the next step is in our timeline, um, the term algorithm I already explained. In 1763, we get to Thomas Bayes, um, who introduced the uh, ideas of Bayesian inference. So what you see in the, in the middle of this uh, picture, it's a formula. And What's really important in this formula is that given a prior, a belief of the current state, if you do or you make an observation, you can update that belief. And that's a way of learning, which is the basis probably for how we learn, but also how machines can learn. And then the next really important step, I think, is around the 50s, much of the work done by Alan Turing who, among other things, introduced the Turing test, uh, which is a test where uh, a person needs to find out if this agent with whom it's um, interacting is a computer or a human. So uh, the example is a kind of uh, conversation where you ask uh, questions to that agent and you have to find out by its answers if it's a computer or a human being. I say that now AI is so far that we're not able to distinguish it anymore 
from human responses. But experts also have um, explained now, well, it's just a test of how well um, this machine can mimic human behavior. It's not really a test that it means the system is intelligent like human beings. Well, the term machine learning was coined in 1959. And what's important, I think, in the 1980s is that we saw a shift from rule-based AI to statistical models, uh, which I will explain. So a very important breakthrough is that in the late 90s, 80s and 90s, the first convolutional neural network called LeNet was developed by the team from Jan LeCun. And it showed the potential of neural networks because it could do tasks much better than previous networks. Uh, at its website, you can see uh, examples. Here you see the architecture, how the system looked like. And what's important is Lacoon proposed uh, how a system should look like, but more important, he also had data, uh, a large set of handwritten digits on which to train the system and to show actually its performance. And later on, that inspired many people to also come up with different architectures that were even better and with larger, larger data sets that were richer and could uh, improve the tasks that were trained on much more. So another way to classify AI is not in weak versus strong AI, but the whole uh, collection of different approaches from classical AI based on rule-based systems towards machine learning for pattern recognition and then the current advances in deep learning where actually 90% of the design is done by the computers because the humans, the programmers provide a general architecture but the system is self-organizing and what was really important was um, both Lynette, the first computational neural network, as AlexNet, which was the first system to win the ImageNet challenge. So if we continue our very short history of AI, one really important moment was 1997, when IBM's Deep Blue defeated chess champion Gary Gasparov, which made many people realize the power of machines that were even able to win the classical game of chess, but it was still using a rule-based model. And then a really important enabler was in 2009 when ImageNet was proposed by Fifi Lee. And it's a free database of 14 million labeled uh, images. This became a catalyst for AI development and for breakthroughs in computer vision and deep learning. I don't know about similar databases in audiology of high quality, quality data, except maybe from the UK Biobank, which contains genes. So I think what we need is audio health net. And that should be a rich database of much more than only audiograms of audio profiles, which could become a catalyst for computational audiology, hopefully in the years to come. Because what happened was that this ImageNet led to AlexNet, that won the ImageNet challenge. And you could say the rest is history, but what we need is data of high quality because it's the data that makes the AI system. And then if we continue the short history, a really important uh, moment, I think, was 2016 when uh, both Microsoft as Google claimed that their speech recognition systems were on par with human transcribers. Um, and this, again, was a breakthrough based on large data sets because Google had been... Um, training their systems on uh, lots of the 
videos on, on YouTube. Um, then another important uh, milestone was 2017 when the first transformer model was proposed, which is the basics for the large language models that we are witnessing uh, today. And um, in 2021, GPT-3 was launched, which is basically the AI generation, uh, text generation system that well, everybody now knows of. Um, and recently, the wet uh, Swanepoel and I were interviewed by Dave Kemp for the podcast uh, This Week in Hearing, where we discuss how this could be used in hearing healthcare. And so if you're interested, um, feel free to, to listen to that podcast. So what's computational audiology? To be more specific, it's based on algorithms and data-driven modeling techniques, uses uh, modern data collection tools to um, provide better clinical care. So my one uh, sentence uh, summary would be complex models applied to clinical care. And there's many examples on, on the website, uh, computationaudiology.com, and also uh, provided at the virtual conferences of computational audiology that is a series that started in 2020. So let's, um, prov let's go through some of the examples uh, in computational audiology. And um, let's first take a glimpse on some of the approaches that already have been done in the past. So you could say that audiology is very suitable for computational models and algorithms since it's very numer numerical. And for instance, uh, in the 40s and 50s, uh, Georg von Bekesi, he collected data from measurements on um, cochleas of uh, corpses. And this way he unraveled the um, tonotopy in the cochlea. And an example of maybe a, an algorithm is uh, the null prescription uh, rule that was already developed in 1986 by uh, Dennis Byrne and Harvey Dillon. Um, well, there's some examples of big data in, in audiology, like a collection of audiograms. And a very important and interesting development is machine learning audiometry based on patient active learning, um, which I will explain in another slide in more detail. And that we have discussed also at a podcast about Bayesian active uh, learning with Dennis Barber, Joseph Slittelacher and Bette Vries, who were independently developers of uh, Bayesian active learning algorithms to assess uh, individuals' audiograms. Also interesting um, developments are neural networks used to mimic human uh, hearing as developed by the uh, laboratories from Just McDermott and Cyber for Hulst. And if you want to more, uh, learn more about that, I invite you to um, look at the presentation given by Just McDermott at the VCCA back in 2021, what was recorded, and the upcoming presentation by Sarah at the VCCA 2023 in June this year. So how would this translates to clinical care and to helping uh, people with hearing loss. Well, the challenges ahead are incredibly large. There's more than 1500 million people with some degree of hearing loss and there's not enough clinicians, audiologists to uh, help all those uh, people. And it's not only the number of people we need or trained professionals, but also equipment. Um, so, in short, we need new tools, we have to think about other clinical workflows and other ways to provide our services. So, for instance, how can we improve the access to hearing health services? Well, the penetration of mobile phones, especially also smart smartphones worldwide, is more than 80%. So, that means that almost anybody has access to a smartphone which could be used 
for instance with apps for automated audiometry for screening or diagnostic purposes or it could be the interface for remote care to do tests at home troubleshooting um, or it can uh, maybe uh, turn hearables into hearing aids and here you see uh, references to two scoping reviews that were performed last year to assess the lay of the land. And what we see now that there are tools developed for remote support. For instance, this is data provided by uh, Stefan Launer from Sonova about the total number of fittings done in clinic, which is gray. And in blue, you see the remote fittings. So that's still a really tiny percentage. So although we have the tools, we are not yet able to apply it, I think, on the scale that we need it. And here we can ask ourselves the question, what are these barriers? Is it our own reluctance to apply these um, remote care models? We have to think about how to um, steer this more positively and as clinicians I think we can take the initiative to improve this because there's a lot of advantages of remote care for yeah, your own clinic um, and especially of course for uh, for your patients uh, customers um, and there's examples of specific groups which was provided by researchers from Sonova that it can be more engaging for teenagers and that for instance, girls tended to uh, chat more with their audiologist via texting interfaces. And something I can also relate to myself when we did remote uh, care research in cochlear implant users, that we used a, a messenger system, which really provided a nice team, a nice way to interact since uh, the hearing loss was not a barrier. And that is helping you in creating a, a level playing field. And people also shared unsolicited information about maybe problems they experienced or things they desired, which can be the opening for follow-up conversations or for better suggestions. Another important driver, I think, is well the carbon footprint of our, all our travels to, to the clinic and also the well, the lost work days or school days for our patients, if they have to take uh, maybe a free day or uh, many hours be available for a visit to the clinic. And also for small questions or uh, for quick follow-ups, uh, remote care can be uh, really come in handy. Then uh, another interesting development of AI used in hearing healthcare is speech to text, which probably by now everybody has experienced and which can be used in many day to day situations. And it's a matter of time that it will be implemented also on, on glasses and be part of a, an augmented reality, maybe, if you want to say so. And here I would like to share a really nice experience we had, um, which was almost a Turing game for hearing status. I had the pleasure to interview Dmitry Konevsky from Google and uh, Jessica Monaghan and uh, Nikki Chong White from Null about all these breakthroughs in automated speech recognition. And uh, Dmitry, um, he shared his lifetime work of improving these systems. He has lost his hearing in early childhood and he needs his systems to communicate. So what you see here on the picture is actually um, the text of what he is saying so that it helped us to um, better understand his impaired uh, speech while he could uh, read the text, the transcription of what uh, we were saying. And during this conversation, Nikki lost the connection to her AirPods, so she, but she could continue um, the talk or this discussion by reading uh, the live transcript and so uh, Jessica and I didn't even notice it which I believe 
uh, this kind of Turing test for hearing status is liberating for people who now suffer from a hearing loss and skip group activities because they feel they cannot really be part of it. So with these kinds of developments, we can make group meetings more inclusive, regardless of hearing status. And here are some um, tips how to use this in your clinic. So here you see on the picture uh, an example of Nullscribe, which was an app specifically developed for audiology centers. And especially in the time of wearing face masks, where people could not lip read, it was a really helpful tool that people could read what um, care providers were saying to them. But it's important that you always try to keep the screen between the speaker and the listener. So that also a lot of your expression on your face can be used by the listener. And, and this is because that's one, one, of, one of the drawbacks. Yeah, that the minimum ability for speech reading if people are reading text. Another important uh, factor is the position of the microphone. I want to have it, of course, near the speaker to optimally capture the voice. And when you're in a group with multiple speakers or uh, talkers, you would like to have multiple microphones to best collect their individual voices. So some of my patients also said that they were actually anxious to go from the virtual meetings again to the in-office meetings where they didn't have the advantages that ASR and also the separate microphones provided them. And some general communication tips are of course to speak in a calm and clear manner. So sometimes when I use these systems, I get corrected because I see, oops, I talk too fast. And if the system cannot follow it, then probably the person um, that I'm talking to also have difficulties to follow me. And another important check is of course, to check if you're understood correctly and make corrections if necessary. Now then there's a lot of features that can be powered by AI. So here I have some examples um, like noise reduction, which we'll, we'll go in through into more detail, personalized sound uh, profiles, all kinds of adjustments that can be suggested by an AI agent when you're using a device. Um, and well, here you see also some of the limitations of these AI generated technologies, because I wanted to create an infogram with pictures or pictograms of these different features. And I specifically asked the system not to use any text, but well, you see it all over the place. Um, and another important development is that these features can be integrated in uh, larger health applications. So your hearing aid might uh, also uh, count steps and that's a marker for healthy living. And here's uh, some more examples. Another example, well, this is the Bayesian active learning that can be used for quick diagnostics to measure the audiogram um, quicker or maybe measure more. So here is a, an animation created by Joseph Schlittenlacher. Here you see an, uh, an audiogram, but then the axes are flipped. So the normal hearing line is around here. And what you see is that there's the estimation of the audiogram, but you also see a measure of the certainty that the algorithm has for its estimation, for its prediction. And the more stimuli it provides, the smaller this uncertainty gets, which is really informative, I think, because often if people have performed an audiogram and they have some doubts, then, well, they provide this as, an, as maybe some comments, but it's hard to, to quantify it or to use it maybe a couple of years later, if you did, don't know anymore the exact situation and circumstances when you performed your audiogram. And these kind of tests can also be used for other tests than the audiogram, like um, loudness uh, growth or um, 
that regions in the cochlea, Joseph Slitterlacher has um, provided more of these algorithms. And I think it would be a really great breakthrough if we would be able to bring this into clinical practice. Then some remarks about noise reduction by deep neural networks or speech enhancements. Um, there's just this paper um, released from Eric Healy et al, where what they say is a key is the, uh, to efficacy, is the ability of an algorithm to generalize to conditions not encountered during network training. So what they have is a really large set of different noises and speakers, and that's where they train the network on. But of course, somebody who's using these algorithms will in daily life encounter different voices, different situations, reverberation, noise acoustics, etc. But what you see here is an example of um, a clean voice segment from the hint sentences, then how it uh, looks like when it's really noisy, so really difficult to see the signal, and again how it looks like after this algorithm has cleaned and enhanced it. This was an intensive recurrent network. Um, I'm glad to share that um, we will also discuss this further at the VCCA 2023. And if I would think about potential future applications would be to tie these kind of algorithms to large language models because long, large language models are basically predictive, predictors try to predict what will be the next word that somebody is saying, which I often see many people doing who have a hearing loss. They try to um, guess what's the next word. So if a large language model would help you guessing the next word provided to the algorithm that's cleaning the signal, that may, might give even more benefits provided that these algorithms get fast enough and computationally efficiently enough that you can build it into uh, an actual hearing aid. Another really cool example is virtual training. So the group from Cambridge led by Debbie Vickers and, um, and others, they created virtual reality glasses that teenagers with bilateral cochlear implants could use and uh, to improve their spatial hearing. Um, well, it was presented at VCCA 2021, if you want to know more. And it's also been published now in Frontiers in Digital Health. Or you could use these networks to simulate human listeners. So maybe as a researcher or as a clinician, you think, ah, this could be a good setting. Let's test it in this uh, in silico situation. And if it really gives an improvement, then provide it to your patient. And then this way you can test many more settings than is feasible in real life. And Bernd Meyer presented this at the VCCA 2022. Then another really interesting development, very recent from this year, are the potential applications of AI chatbots in hearing healthcare. So here's an example of how Patients could use it, for instance, for uh, screening by um, explaining the problems they experience and that this chatbot could assess if this person needs further testing. It could help um, by providing education and support, um, explain about maybe really difficult listening situations and how to make those situations easier by maybe reducing background noise. Um, could help also in getting people to the clinic, providing follow-up uh, reminders, or um, be kind of uh, assistance in teleaudiology services. Okay, so how could you use a chatbot in your clinical practice? Imagine you have 
seen a patient, tested uh, his uh, hearing, and this uh, he had his audiogram as the result. What you know is that this is an older person with bilateral atresia. So you would expect maybe maximum conductive hearing loss on both sides. Uh, you provide advice and this person goes home and then don't re doesn't remember everything you have explained during the visit. And so what this person could do is just make a photo of the audiogram, upload it to an AI chatbot, maybe even a chatbot that your own clinic powers so that it can access also information from this uh, patient. And what you see here is what I would call then the input audiogram. And what's interesting is this is a real audiogram from our clinic in Nijmegen using local conventions for, for instance, for the insert phones. So these are symbols that I'm sure GPT-4 has never seen before. It's not trained on similar audiograms. And let's test what the GPT-4 makes out of this audiogram. So here you see an application, mini GPT-4. It's uh, developed for image classification. And what I did, I, to the left, you see the audiogram. I uploaded it to uh, mini GPT-4. And then I asked this system, please explain this audiogram to me. What type of hearing loss do I have? Then if you look at the answer, it's interesting that it says the audiogram shows that the person has normal hearing in the low and mid frequencies, but has a moderate hearing loss in the high frequencies. So that's completely wrong. But if you realize that uh, the green arrow or the green line that indicates the age related hearing loss, just what we use as a reference uh, in our audiograms, then the system made a right description, only not of the, the right audiogram. Um, but for a first guess or a first attempt, I would say it's not that bad. It's comparable that with the answers I get from medical students that we explain about how to read audiograms and often the, they have similar interpretations. So I see there's a lot of potential to further train these systems so that they, instead of um, providing some guesses, provide really good information that maybe we have clinicians have also validated or verified to make sure that we give the right information to our patients. And so here's a first version of an audio or hearing healthcare chatbot. It's uh, called Ellen. And I'd like to refer to Ellen as uh, non-binary, um, but it's something I'll uh, have to get used to still. Um, why is this interesting? Well, what's interesting is that Ellen has been written by GPT for itself. I just asked GPT for, please program for me a chatbot. And this is what it uh, provided. Um, well, I'm not a programmer myself, so that's one thing I find striking. The other thing is that, yeah, you can actually use it. It uh, contacts the uh, open AI uh, API and it will provide you answers. When it's not related to audiology, it should provide an answer like, oh, I'm uh, an audiologist. I don't, uh, I'm not an expert on that question that you asked me. And I can say it doesn't work flawless, but what I can imagine is that Alan and I would uh, form a kind of centaur audiology team. So that's human and machine together. So, uh, it's known from centaur chess because in 1997, Gary Gasparov was defeated, but in 1998, he held the first uh, game of centaur chess where teams of half human, half horse, or uh, half human, half AI um, uh, competed to each other. And in the first years of this combination, the combination human and AI was stronger than AI only. And I think in uh, hearing healthcare, we could make benefit of the 
potential of AI and of course our own strengths as clinicians. So that brings me now to the part of the risks of artificial intelligence and here I state the artificial general intelligence. I saw this uh, picture uh, which I found really powerful where you see AI to the right side and the nuclear bomb to the left side and a quote from Albert Einstein um, why is it now in the media well the godfather of AI um, Geoffrey Hinton just left Google because of concerns he has for AI and I think in these discussions it's about this strong general AI and there's people who uh, have um, doubts or worries about this development because they say this AI could surpass humanity in general intelligence and become super intelligent. And how would we be able to control such super intelligent system or being? Uh, we don't know of less intelligent beings controlling, controlling beings of superior intelligence. And I think that's a good risk to think about since, well, the nuclear bomb is something we were able to contain in the end but if we unleash super intelligent we don't know if we could get the genie back into the bottle again another reason why i want to use this picture is that to the left it's nuclear fissure but of course nuclear powers also include nuclear fusion which could provide almost an endless energy to humankind and the same goes i think for ai that we can use it for creation or for destruction and i'm sure i'm not able to cover all important aspects and i just wanted to show so let me take or share my two cents on this very complex topic and let me state first that i take a bayesian approach here that what i share here is my current belief but i'm happy to update it if new evidence and observations are shared with me. But I believe that the biggest threat is our ignorance and how we can ignore the suffering of other beings. An example being me buying petrol for my car, knowing that it's coming from countries where maybe human rights are not respected and that actually driving this car has a very bad influence on climate change. And there's many more examples, of course. A very easy one is Tom Lehrer referring to um, in this song, uh, once those rockets are up, who cares where they come down? That's not my department, says Werner von Braun. Another way that where our ambition maybe makes us blind for the consequences of our actions. And although 90% of people have good faith, somehow we tend to choose the 10% that doesn't. And that's how we are ruled by people like Mr. Putin or Mr. Trump and their likes, which make a bigger threat for society, for people with different thoughts or race than maybe the nuclear powers that we control or the power of AI that we may control in the future. So let us be aware of these risks and think about how to control it. There's one positive example I'd like to share and that's that when you lived in the 18th century, you could know that if you buy sugar, it would have been produced, for instance, in Jamaica by enslaved people. And it was in the UK that women started to not buy sugar anymore. It was the example of the first boycott of a product just because people wanted to not be complacent to slavery. And here, I think we have to think about rules or you know, ways to make the rule of law such that it protects vulnerable people. Well, there's much more, of course, to say about this topic, but let's focus on uh, AI and hearing healthcare again. And then we can look at the risk of narrow AI. So I think this is of a completely different order. Uh, the other day I made this 
remark that, for instance, music generated by AI, I don't think that will have devastating consequences for humankind. And the same goes for applying AI in hearing healthcare. Of course, we have to be really considering both the positive as the negative consequences. Here, I believe that most of these consequences are comparable to a digital revolution that we are already in. So what I stated here is risks that are uh, tied to data. For instance, biases in data that make our predictions based on this data um, wrong or biased. Or the violation of privacy because of collecting data that people don't give consent to, for instance, or the problem that we don't control the data while it's maybe saying something about us or it's uh, affecting our, our lives. And there's uh, other risk of uh, AI, which is more about the responsibility, like making a system that has positive uh, applications, but can also be used negatively, like um, a lip reading system that I think can support uh, communication between hearing and um, hearing impaired people but it can also be used for surveillance, for instance, by a dictatorial regime. And there's also the question of liability. And therefore, it's really important that we come up with oversight and regulation. Here is, I think, a challenge for our professional societies and for us as professionals to not to do nothing. I think it's important to experiment and to commit errors but learn from it and improve the system. What I would like to share therefore is this mindset of infinite games, because I think this world where we live in is or can be regarded as an infinite game, where there are no clear rules and there's no winning or losing, but the only objective is to keep playing. Healthcare is an example because there's always people that suffer from sickness. And the only thing what we can do as actors in this game is we cannot de define the rules, but we can define the roles we are playing and also see how we uh, respond to new players that join. For instance, in, in healthcare, that's Google or maybe new colleagues that, uh, that join us. So I presented this before as the game of computational audiology. And um, of course, don't take this too seriously, but I think it helps in taking an, a mindset of thinking of the consequences of our actions. And for playing this game, it's important to have the motivation and the resources to do so. And as clinicians, we should think about maybe pooling our resources so that we can um, compete in this very large field. And, and here again, I uh, reintroduce Alan as uh, a virtual audiologist with superpowers and wireless uh, capabilities. In uh, the heart of him, in the middle, you see the public domain mark, which means that there's uh, is free of known copyright restrictions in the and therefore in the public domain. And he's a tribute, as I said, to Alan Turing who played a crucial role in cracking intercepted code, coded messages from uh, the German Enigma system, which enabled the allies to defeat the Axis powers in many crucial engagements. However, uh, Turing was prosecuted for homosexual acts after the war, war and uh, uh, received chemically, chemical castration. And only after his death, uh, the UK government apologized for the way uh, for the way Alan Turing was treated. So, what is the role for audiologists, clinicians, uh, and professional societies? I think we have to anticipate the developments and the, maybe the scenarios that can play out. 
develop a, a shared vision of in what direction we want to go and what we can do is share our best practices and maybe also our errors and think about how to share data so that we can also better share or learn lessons. And do realize that uh, this game of audiology has no boundaries. So what players in Europe or the US are doing is affecting players around the globe. And so on. we cannot get out of this game. So I would suggest that we think about more open systems for exchange of data, because you can imagine that you see a person with mild hearing loss today, and that person has measured uh, his hearing loss using automated audiometry and is now using an OTC for a first uh, kind of rehabilitation. But 10 years later, maybe that hearing loss may have been progressing and maybe a clinic would be the best um, place to go to for further treatment. Would you be able then to also use this data that was collected before in other systems and other clouds and use that to predict the future hearing status? I think the only way to do so is creating more open ecosystems based on fair principles to make the data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And here's an attempt to share resources where I mean research software, but also clinical tools and best practices so that we can inspire peers, increase transparency and learn from each other and build a community where we try to um, learn from each other's tools and maybe facilitate cooperation across centers because only then can we play a role on an international scale. So you can scan this QR code to get to the website where there's a list of resources and models and um, feel free to reach out to me if you have an interesting demo or tool that you think could also benefit your peers. And then I'd like to summarize a short list of recommendations. So think of the care you provided in an infinite mindset way not on the short term, but also think about this long term consequences. And then you may realize as I or maybe agree with me that we need AI automation. So to assist us so that we can serve more people with hearing loss to improve access to hearing health care. And a really important facilitator is open standards and ways to exchange data. And let me remind again that in computer vision, it was the image net that made the breakthrough uh, uh, possible. And I think if we create an audio health net with really rich data in it, we can further uh, improve AI in hearing healthcare or computational audiology and hopefully have uh, benefits of uh, interoperability and our collaboration. And of course, we should not neglect some of the risks that I mentioned before of big data and uh, AI technology. But it starts that more people are understanding that it's the data that makes the AI and that therefore we have to be open, to be transparent and to be able to mitigate risks. If you want to learn more about these developments and of the developments that are really currently happening, please join the VCCA this year. It's uh, June 29 and June 30. It's more aimed or tailored towards researchers. And I'm really happy to share that we have excellent keynotes and featured uh, talks and also a lot of nice submitted uh, talks that you can follow. Most of them will be also recorded so that you can uh, look back if it's not in your time zone. Um, Dr. Professor Malcolm Slaney will tell, share his experiences at uh, Google's uh, Machine Hearing Research uh, Group. Uh, Professor Ilian Wang will tell us more about deep learning and how it can be used in uh, speech enhancement, while uh, Professor Sarah Verhulst will share her insights in how deep uh, learning can be used in computational auditory models and in mimicking 
humans and also improving hearing aids and other devices. So if you would like to know more about computational audiology, there's lots of resources. There's previous presentations at the VCCA, like for instance, the keynote from 2021 by Josh McDermott, who tells more about new models of human hearing via deep learning. There's uh, the podcast uh, from the Computational Audiology Network, Computational Audiology Television. And uh, if you scan this QR code, you will get to computationaldiology.com where we have, um, as I said before, collected a lot of resources and interesting models to learn about. And uh, so feel free to explore and uh, have fun by getting to know more about the potential of AI in audiology. Lastly, there's this great presentation from Martin Gurner about deep learning without a PhD where he really shows how to train uh, deep learning systems. For instance, on this application of the digits recognition, I think it's uh, three hours in total and really awesome uh, if you want to know more about this. So you can also find it on, uh, on the website or uh, computationaudiology.com or just follow the link below or Google uh, TensorFlow and Deep Learning. Thank you for your attention and um, happy to address your questions. And of course, you can uh, ask Ellen for any question related to audiology or email Ellen or me and uh, looking forward to connect and uh, learn with you and see what the future will have in store for us.